Hello and welcome to this sample lecture. My name is Mark Bühner and I'm a professor of psychology at Cardiff University. One of the things I do in Cardiff is that I teach a module to our students about the psychology of decision making. And so today I'm going to give you a very brief taster of some of the ideas that we're discussing in that module so that you can have a sample of the type of teaching that you can expect at Cardiff University um, if you come to study psychology with us. So decision making is a very interesting topic. We make decisions all the time throughout our lives. Every morning we might decide what we have for breakfast, what we are going to wear that day, um, where we're going and so forth. Many decisions we make almost autom automatically and other decisions we think about and agonize over um, for a long time. So one of the things, um, of course, that, that we're concerned with is the quality of our decisions. We, of course, always want to make good decisions. We always want to make the best decision that's possible. And so the first question that we can ask is, well, how do you actually define what is a good or what is a bad decision? And so um, and here's a little exercise for you. I want you to take some time, maybe 10 seconds or so, and think of an example in your own life of a good decision that you have made and then also of a bad decision that you have made. And it can be anything. And um, so I'm going to wait 10 seconds or so to give you a chance to think about this. Okay. So hopefully you've now um, thought of an example of a good and a bad decision that you have made in your life. Now, um, I would bet that um, there's a very high chance that for the good decision that you thought of, the outcome was good. Things went well for you. And in the bad decision, um, I'm pretty confident that um, you came up with an idea, with a decision where, where things didn't go well for you, where the outcome was bad. So um, it might be tempting, therefore, to confound um, the quality of a decision with the quality of the outcome. If the outcome was good, it was a good decision. If the outcome was bad, it was a bad decision. To which I say, really? I mean, if we were to define decisions by their outcome, we can very quickly see that that's quite flawed. Why? Because we always need to take into account not just the outcome of a decision, but also the associated risk, the uncertainty that comes with that decision. So we need to take probabilities into account. And um, very, so for instance, um, think of a gambling example. So we probably would all agree that it's not a very good decision to take all your life savings, go to the casino and bet it on one number, the number 13, for, ex for example. Um, that wouldn't be a good decision, right? I think everybody can agree with that. But suppose you win. Suppose, you know, against all odds you win and you make a spectacular gain. Does that make that a good decision? You were just lucky, but it was still a pretty bad decision. But it's not just with, with winnings, it's also with um, when the outcome is bad. So um, you might have heard that sometimes there's a very, very small likelihood if you have a car accident, there are some types of car accident who are actually you're better off not having a seatbelt because not, not wearing a seatbelt propels you out of the car and that is what, what enables you to survive. It's very, very rare, these kind of freak car accidents. But suppose um, somebody is involved in a freak car accident like that and they did wear a seatbelt and they die. We wouldn't say, well, that was a stupid decision they shouldn't have worn a seatbelt, then they would be alive. Yeah. So just because in that incident um, there was a bad outcome that arose from wearing the seatbelt, that doesn't mean that the decision to wear a seatbelt was a bad one. So the message here is um, we cannot assess decision quality just by the outcome. We also have to think about, um, amongst other things, probabilities. But probabilities aren't the only thing, it's also the context in which we make the decision that matters. So suppose 
you're terminally ill and there's some kind of life-saving treatment but you haven't got the funds to pay for it. If you're in that situation, then perhaps gambling your entire life savings and the casino desk might be a bit more appealing. You know, you're going to die anyway. And so, you know, that's your, that, that might be your last um, best chance um, to save yourself. Um, and if, if you're going to die, then you can't take your savings with you to the grave. So that might, might make, might make that choice more appealing. So the message here is depending on the context, the type of risk that we're prepared to accept or that, that is good to accept changes. So sometimes under extreme circumstances, extreme risks might be worth it that otherwise wouldn't be worth their whiles. So um, we need to take into account not just the outcome of a decision, but also the risks and probabilities involved as well as the context. So how do we take probability into account? This is the next step that we're going to discuss. And we're going to um, cover a concept from um, economics and, and to some extent also psychology, the concept of expected value. So what is expected value? Expected value, as the name suggests, is what you can reasonably expect to happen um, in a decision that involves uncertainty. And it's uh, defined mathematically by um, this formula here. Um, that we can see. So the expected value of an option, um, of, of an action, uh, excuse me, is um, you take all the different outcomes that can happen and you multiply them by the associated probabilities with those outcomes. That probably sounds a bit complicated, so it's best if we explain it in an example. So um, the examples that are coming now, they're all from the gambling domain. And that's um, the simple reason for that is because with gambling, it's very easy, it's tangible, there's money involved, and it's relatively easy to calculate the probabilities. We use those gambling examples to illustrate the principles, but then, um, and you will see that later, we apply it to real life. So if you study the psychology of decision-making, you're not just going to study gambling. We use gambling simply because um, it's an easy way to illustrate principles. So in this example here, um, we're talking about gambling with two dice. And the question that we're thinking about is, should you take an even money bet on snake eyes? So snake eyes is the outcome when you roll two dice um, and you roll two ones because it looks like snake eyes. Um, and so suppose the game is such that you win $10 if you roll two ones and you lose ten dollars otherwise. So let's take a look at the probabilities. What are the chances of winning? So there's only one instance where you win and that's when you roll two ones. So the probability is one over six times one over six. So that makes it a chance of one in 36 of winning. And conversely, on every other outcome you lose. So um, the chance of losing is 35 over 36. So therefore, the expected value of our proposition is 1 over 36 times $10 plus 35 over 36 times minus $10. So that's 28 cents minus $9.72. And that gives us an expected value of minus $9.44. So we can see that it's not worth taking that gamble, it's a very bad decision indeed. Now, we probably wouldn't have needed maths to work that out. Hopefully, every one of you immediately said, well, why would you play that? That's a really silly game. But just to go back um, to our earlier point, suppose you played that game and you won against all odds, it would still have been a bad decision because you were, you were just lucky, but in the long run, you're losing because the expected value is negative. So let's um, take a more detailed look at, at this and how we can use expected value um, to help ourselves um, make better decisions. So let's change the gambling proposition a little bit. And let's say you win 10 pounds, sorry, $10 for snake eyes. And in all other instances, you just don't win anything. And suppose 
I'm going to sell tickets and say, hey, do you want to play this game? It's, it's like a lottery. How much should you pay for a ticket to play this game? When is it worthwhile for you to play this game? So again, we can calculate the expected value of our proposition. And the chance of winning, as before, is 1 over 36. And if we do win, we get $10.00 and we're not winning in 35 out of 36 cases so we get zero dollars then so our expected value of this game gamble ten dollars when you roll snake eyes zero otherwise is 27 cents so therefore in answering the question how much should you be willing to pay for a ticket to play this lottery the answer is anything less than 27 cents would be a worthwhile investment on your part. Why? Because it maximizes the expected value. Anything more than $27, 27 cents, sorry, would be a bad decision because you're paying more than the expected value of that gamble. And so therefore, in the long run, you would lose. So we might think that we can take the expected value to assess um, the value of, a, of um, a decision and that might help us to decide whether a good decision uh, whether whether a decision is good or bad like a good decision is one that maximizes expected value but things aren't as simple and if you dive deeper into uh, the psychology of decision making you will find that there are lots of paradoxes sometimes philosophical paradoxes um, that make things difficult and one paradox that we're briefly going to look at now is a very old one called the St. Petersburg Paradox. And it goes like this. Imagine the following game. We toss a coin, a normal fair coin, and we toss it for however many times it takes for it to land on tails. And if it wins, if it lands on tails, you win. Now, if it lands on tails on the first toss, you win two dollars. If it lands, lands on heads on the first toss, then we toss again. And if it lands on tails on the second toss, you win $4. If after two tosses it still hasn't landed on tails, we toss a third time and you get $8. So basically, we, we flip the coin for however long it's going to take for it to land on tails. And the payout for you doubles each time. So the longer this goes on for, the more money you will win. Yeah, so it's pre pretty simple. So when I do this in a lecture, I ask my students, how much would you be willing to pay to play the game? And obviously this comes straight after they've learned how to calculate expected value. So, you know, maybe you've been busily thinking about this, you know, what is the expected value of this? And maybe you want to reflect on that for a few seconds. But I can tell you that when I do this in class, People say maybe $5, some 4 some even want to pay just $2 for this. Very, very rarely there's somebody who says they would um, pay $10 to play this. I don't think I've ever had anybody who, who was prepared to pay more than $10 for this. Well, we've just learned how to calculate expected value, so let's see how, how it pans out. What is the expected value of this game? So our expected value is this. We have a 50% chance that we win $2. That's on the first coin flip, yeah? And then the game is over and we've won. So that's 50% chance of winning $2. If we haven't won on the first coin flip, then there's a 25% chance, so 50% times 50%, that we win on the second toss. And if we win, we win $4. If we haven't won then, then it's three tosses, that's 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5. So that's one over eight, that we win $8 and so forth. So you can see that our expected value actually goes on into infinity. So the expected value of this game is infinite. So why then aren't you willing to pay a million dollars to play this game? What's wrong here? You know, the expected value is infinite, yet to us, we can intuitively immediately see 
that nobody would would pay that much and in fact most people as i said before maybe they're willing to fork out five dollars or so to play this game there's two answers to why um what's what's wrong here why why we don't want to pay that much to play this game i'll give you the first one and then um i'll discuss the second one afterwards the first one is really there to introduce you to the idea of expected utility as opposed to expected value so the expected value of a decision is more often than not a poor yardstick for psychologists why because value reflects economic reality whereas as psychologists what we're concerned with is the psychological reality so how much is it really worth to you to you as an individual and the utility is different for one person to the next you know we all value things slightly dif differently but nonetheless what we can see is typically the utility function is this negatively accelerated curve that you can see in this slide where on the x-axis we have the quantity of money going up and on the y-axis we have the subjective utility of a person and the negatively accelerated um, nature of this curve means that as we increase the economic value um, the difference in psychological utility gets smaller and smaller and smaller so one way to explain this is imagine you find you walk down the street and you find ten dollars on the on the pavement so you're pretty happy you know ten dollars that's great and compare that to how you would feel if you found twenty dollars you'd be even happier of course yeah so the difference and that's a ten dollar difference so think about the difference in happiness between finding ten dollars versus finding twenty dollars and then say you find a hundred dollars on the street you'd be very happy compared to hundred and ten dollars so the difference in happiness between finding or winning unexpectedly a hundred dollars versus a hundred and ten dollars wouldn't be that great so that extra ten dollars going from a hundred dollars to hundred and ten dollars will not be giving you that much more happiness compared to going from ten dollars to twenty dollars yeah even though economically we're talking about the same ten dollar difference psychologically the more and more and more you gain you the psychological utility is get gets increasingly smaller so that's why even though the expected value of the saint petersburg gamble is infinite the subjective utility of that probably isn't there's another of course obvious reason why um, people don't um, like to gamble large stakes on the saint petersburg um, paradox and that is because this payout assumption is unrealistic so say you were playing this game with me you would probably assume that even if it goes on for a long time i wouldn't actually be willing to fork out millions and millions of dollars to you in fact i wouldn't be able to pay you that much because i haven't got it but even if you played say with bill gates who has many many millions at his disposal even his amount of money is finite yeah even all the wealth in the world is finite we can put a number to it how many billions trillions dollars are in the economy and it's not infinite and then what you can see mathematically very quickly is if you put a finite um, number to it even if it's in the millions and millions of dollars the expected value is quite small um, so it isn't it isn't in the in the hundreds and thousands or, or millions of pounds and that's why uh, another reason why people um, don't don't um, wouldn't wouldn't be willing to to have a high stakes bet on the uh, saint petersburg paradox because they implicitly know um, that this infinite payout assumption is not realistic 
So I hope I've demonstrated to you then um, this idea now um, of how we can relate outcomes and probabilities to one another, that we, instead of using expected value, we use expected utility. And of course, how this utility function looks like, that's where the psychology kicks in. And we cannot go really into much detail into, into how that works. You would have to come to Cardiff to find out more um, about that. But what we can do is um, looking at some more interesting effects in decision making. And that is, for instance, how we assess gains versus losses. So gains and losses aren't quite the same. So um, let's look at prospect theory, which um, discusses those things. And you might have heard about this. Again, a hypothetical gambling example. Imagine I give you a chance, I offer you a gamble. You can either have $100 for certain, or we flip a coin. And if you win, you get $200. And if you lose, you get nothing. So you can have one of those two things. So have a little think about um, what you want, what you would want out of those two options. Now, when I do that in the classroom, an overwhelming majority of people says they want the hundred pounds for sure. I'm not sure whether that's the same for you. And if we go back to consider what we've just discussed, you can see that the expected value of those two options is identical. Hundred pounds, uh, hundred dollars, sorry times 100% is 100. Flipping a coin, we have a 50% chance to win. So 50% times $200 is $100, and 50% times zero is zero. So, um, and we add those two together in the manner that I've explained earlier. So our expected value for those two things is the same. But because of what we've just learned, with um, subjective utility being this negatively accelerated curve, the hundred pounds for sure has a higher subjective value to most people than the coin flip. And that's why most people in this situation choose um, the sure thing. They choose the $100 for certain. And as psychologists, we call that being risk averse. So when we present you with um, a, a decision between two options that have the same expected value, Typically, people are risk averse. They choose the sure thing. Now we turn the tables and we, have, we imagine a situation where you have to give me money. And we can do this in one of two ways. Either you give me $100 or we flip a coin. And if you lose, you have to give me $200. And if you win, you can walk away scot-free without having to pay me anything. But it has to be one of those two things. Now think about which would you rather have. If I do this in a classroom, an overwhelming majority now goes for the coin flip. Thinking back to the expected value, we can again see that the expected value of both options is the same. It's minus $100. We can expect to lose $100 in either case, but now people are risk seeking. They want to have um, the chance to walk away without making any loss. And again, we can explain that with prospect theory, um, with this uh, utility function, and we can see here that um, the curve is steeper for losses than for gains. So what we can see is that basically, um, as I said before, winning a hundred dollars, so talking about the plus side, psychologically is worth more than half of winning $200. Yeah, so that's here. So um, that's why people um, uh, prefer the sure thing, the $100, over um, a chance to win $200. And when we're talking about losses um, here, losing $100 hurts more than half as much as it would to lose $200. And that's why people are prepared to take that risk. And that means that um, if you think about this in, in everyday contexts, almost every decision has gain and loss aspects to it. So if you buy a new car, you have a gain, you get the car, and you have a loss, you have to part with some money. And what this shows us is that depending on whether we focus on the gain or the loss aspects of a decision, our attitude to risk changes. 
And this is called framing effects. And you can also appreciate that these kinds of things will have implications in the millions of dollars um, for all sorts of things. Just think about questions like, should I take out travel insurance, for example? So if you take out travel insurance, you have a certain loss, you have to pay for the policy, but you protect yourself against a potentially very unlikely much larger loss. Yeah, so with these sorts of decisions or retirement savings, all, um, all these kinds of decisions, um, depending on whether you look at the gain or loss aspects, your attitude to uncertainty will change. And we're going to look um, at, a, at a nice example, um, which is called the status quo effect, um, how we can demonstrate this in everyday um, circumstances. And here's a video that we made um, a few years ago at an open day as a public engagement event at Cardiff University. So here's the video. We make choices every day of our lives. Will I have toast or cereal for breakfast? Which route do I take to work today? A common assumption is that we make decisions based on our preferences. I like toast better than cereal, so that's what I'm going to have. We choose what we think will give us the greatest happiness, but what we decide is frequently influenced by seemingly trivial external or contextual factors. To demonstrate one such factor, we ran a live experiment at one of our School of Psychology open days. Visitors to the open day were invited to participate in a short experiment on decision-making and motor skill. We set up a carnival-style booth with a ball-throwing task. Volunteers had to try and throw a juggling ball into a pot from a two-meter distance. To entice them to participate, we offered a chocolate reward if they scored. We told them that they could either throw with their dominant hand and win one chocolate bar, or throw with their non-dominant hand and win two chocolate bars. In economics terms, we therefore presented our volunteers with a choice between a low-risk, low-reward option, the dominant hand, and a high-risk, high-reward option, the non-dominant hand. But here's the twist. We randomly divided our participants into two groups or conditions. One group of participants were presented with the low-risk, low-reward option as the default, and the other with the high-risk, high-reward option as the default. The instructions for both groups were explained in a short video that participants watched before entering the throwing booth. Once they had heard the instructions, participants had to pick up a ball with either their dominant or non-dominant hand, depending on condition, and walk into the booth to take their throw. Before throwing, they were given a final choice. Stay with whatever the default option was, or switch to the other hand. The question was whether people would make their decision based purely on a judgment of risk and reward, or whether the way the options were presented or framed would have an impact. Let's see what happened. Stick with the left hand or switch to the right hand. If participants decided which hand to throw with based purely on a trade-off between risk and reward, we would expect that the high and low risk options would be chosen equally often in both groups. Well, that's not what we found. 191 people participated in total. Of the 98 people who walked in with the ball in their dominant hand, 75% stuck with that and did not choose to switch. Similarly, of the 93 people who walked in with the ball in their non-dominant hand, the majority, 62%, stuck with that and did not switch. So what happened? People tended to stay with whatever the default option was that had been presented to them. This is known as the status quo effect. People take the current position as their reference and evaluate decisions from that vantage point. So our volunteers didn't decide whether to throw with their dominant or non-dominant hand. Instead, they decided whether to give up one opportunity in exchange for another. 
people are reluctant to give up what they already have. This behavior fits with what we know from cognitive psychology about people assessing losses and gains differently. The potential loss associated with moving away from the default position was perceived as greater than the potential gain of switching to the other option. And that was true regardless of what the default option actually was. Utility companies, banks and insurance providers can exploit this effect to their advantage. The way choices are presented to people, including the options which are marked as default, can have an enormous impact on the decisions people make. So um, you can see what we get up to um, on our open days. We'd like to have some fun. Um, right. So now for the last bit um, of this um, taster lecture, how to put all of that into practice to help ourselves make good decisions. So how do we do this um, to maximize expected utility? Um, here's a little example. So we have to think about acts, states and outcomes. So acts are the things that we can do, that we have control over. States are the possible ways the world can turn out. So states of the world that typically are beyond our control. And then the outcome is the consequence of our action given a certain state. And so here's a little toy example of how we um, assess the quality of a decision to help us make the best decision in a very simple scenario where the decision is, should we plan to have a barbecue outside or eat indoors? So we have two acts at our disposal barbecue versus eating indoors. And because it's a toy example, we have two states of the world. One, the weather is sunny. Two, it's going to rain. And to make things even simpler, let's say the chances are 50-50 of rain versus sun. So just to reiterate, the states are not within our control, but the acts are. So what we need to do is we need to draw up what's called a utility matrix, where we take our two acts, barbecue or cooking indoors, and the two states, sunny versus rain, and um, think about what are the possible outcomes. So one outcome is it's sunny weather and we're barbecuing outside. And we can hopefully agree that that is the best outcome that's the ideal scenario, we like our barbecue. So we are gonna assign that a subjective utility of 100. So we're imagining a scale from zero to 100, where 100 is best and zero is worst. We can probably also very quickly see that if it's raining, we're better off indoors. We're not as happy as if it was sunny and we could have cooked outside, but at least we'll be relieved that we've decided to cook indoors, that it isn't going to be a washout, that our food isn't ruined because it's rained on it um, and the, the coals on the barbecue have gone out. So we give that an intermediary value of, say, 50. And the worst outcome is a washout. So we've set everything up outside, we've heated up the barbecue, we've put the food on the grill, and then it starts pouring down and the fire goes out and the food is ruined. That's the worst outcome. So we're going to give that a utility of zero. So what about um, it turns out to be sunny, but we've decided to be indoors? Well, that's better than the washout. That's for sure. But probably there'll be a little bit of regret. We'll think, hmm, damn, we could have been outside. So that's why probably we're going to assign that a utility that is less than um, if it's raining and we're indoors because if it's raining if, if it's raining and we're indoors we'll experience relief we'll think well good thing that we didn't go outside but you know you might you might assign those utilities differently i mean that's where the subjective nature of all of this comes in but this seems to be a plausible assignment of utilities and now we bring in the probabilities and so our expected utility of the barbecue decision keep in mind we say the chances are 50 50 um, our expected utility of the barbecue decision is 100 times 0 0.5 plus 0 times 0 0.5. So our expected utility for barbecue is 50. And our expected utility for cooking indoors is 50% times 30 plus 50% times 
times 50 um, and that gives us an expected utility of 40. So in our toy example, um, the expected utility uh, for having a barbecue is higher than for cooking inside and so therefore um, a good decision is in this scenario to cook barbecue outside. So good decisions are those that maximize expected utility. That's easier said than done. Um, so in theory, it's very simple um, to maximize expected utility. In practice, this is difficult. Why? Well, for starters, we have imperfect knowledge of the world. So we don't actually know what exactly the probabilities are um, of, say, sun versus rain. We might have, depending on what it is, we might have reasonably good guesses, and that's where psychology comes in. Again, you know, in, in how do we assess probabilities? Um, very often decisions are complex and we have limited cognitive or computational faculties, so we might not be able to take in um, everything. Um, and more often than not, and this is where the psychology really kicks in, our preferences aren't stable, so our mind is fickle. What we like changes from day to day. So we're not what's called internally consistent. And that's where psychologists can really help because they can, they can I help you identify that if that's the case for you and then draw that to your attention and make sure that whatever decision you make um, takes, a, takes that into account. And of course, context sensitivity. So as we alluded to earlier, um, a decision might be good in one context, but not in another. So in an everyday sense, therefore, um, it might not be possible to maximize expected utility but what we can do instead is something called satisficing. So that's a combination of to satisfy and to suffice. And that means that we make an adequate decision rather than an optimal one. So we make a decision that is best given the circumstances. And very often those decisions are near optimal, especially when we take into account um, what's called here information search cost. That means that it takes time to think about things. Paralysis is often um, our biggest enemy. Yeah, We don't make a decision because we're waiting and waiting and waiting for more information. Um, so therefore, often we're better off basically making the best decision we can at the time and putting a limit to how much resources, how much of our time um, we're willing to invest in making the best decision. And we can use... Um, something that's called heuristics. Um, so those are um, acceptable shortcuts. So this is just, of course, skimming the surface of the vast area of decision making. And if you want to find out more about especially these aspects here of how do we do it in the real world, well, then you have to come to Cardiff and take my course where we can teach you all of those things in much greater detail. For now, I hope you've enjoyed this little overview of um, decision making and I do hope I have piqued your interest um, in psychology and particularly um, in Cardiff University. We have loads more information um, about psychology on our YouTube channel where we have lots of public engagement um, material that explains um, other psychological concepts. For now I say goodbye and I hope to see you sometime in Cardiff.